Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us uh, for this webinar today. I'm Alex Manitos, the Executive Director at Ansham Taipei, and it's my pleasure to welcome Knight Frank Australia and the SMATS Group here today to present um, and provide us with some insights into how COVID-19 has impacted the Australian property market. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Knight Frank is the world-leading independent property advisor. It's headquartered in London and has 512 offices in 60 territories with over 19,000 employees. Uh, Repo Knight Frank has been in Taiwan since 1999 and provides market-leading transaction and consultancy services to major institutional investors, private investors, corporates, developers, and homeowners for their personal and business property needs in Taiwan and overseas, such as in Australia, New Zealand, UK, uh, USA, etc. In Australia, Knight Frank has 27 offices and they service both capital cities and regional centers with over 1,200 employees. Uh, while the SMATS Group is the leading provider of Australian taxation and mortgage services to Australian expats, foreign investors, and intended migrants. Uh, SMATS was established in 1995 and has since expanded to include offices in Singapore, Hong Kong, London, Dubai, and New York, with representation in China, Malaysia, Thailand, Vietnam, and Indonesia. Uh, next slide. Um, before we begin, I'd like to quickly go through today's agenda. Um, which is not on the screen yet. Might be a bit of lag, I've got it. Um, so, first of all, we'll have uh, Ben Burston, the Chief Economist of Knight Frank Australia to provide us with an economic update, uh, followed by Ben Schubert, the National Head of Agency of Knight Frank Australia to provide us with an office market update. Uh, then Shane Harris, the National Head of Residential of Knight Frank Australia to provide us with a residential market update. And finally, Steve Douglas, the Executive Chairman of SMATS Group to provide us with some financial tips for investors. Uh, please note that if you have any questions, you can send them throughout the presentations. Uh, there's a chat box function, so if you click, click the speech bubble on um, below your screen, you can ask questions throughout. But we're gonna leave them to the end to the Q&A session to answer them. Uh, finally, it is my pleasure to be hosting this webinar in collaboration with the Australian New Zealand Chamber um, of Commerce in Japan, Auscham China, Beijing, West China, and South China, Auscham Lao, Auscham Singapore, and Auscham Korea. Thank you to these chambers for working with us to put together this webinar today, and welcome to all the members from across the region who are joining with us today. Uh, on that note, I would like to hand it over to our first speaker, Ben, Burst ben Burston, to give us an economic update. Thanks very much, Alex, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, pleasure to be with you to talk through how this uh, remarkable um, event and uh, crisis really um, is impacting uh, on the Australian economy and on the Australian market. I'll, I'll start, as Alex mentioned, with discussion as to how uh, the Australian economy is faring and some uh, current expectations as to how it's likely to fare over the rest of the year and then uh, in some forecasts beyond that as well. And then I'll set the scene for uh, Ben Schubert and Shane to follow on with some comments um, on the office market and on the residential market, respectively, in terms of how they're seeing things playing out on the ground. If we could move on to the first slide, Alex. Uh, what I have presented uh, for you here is a country-by-country country breakdown uh, of where things are at uh, in terms of the spread of COVID-19 on the left, with a look at the, um, the, the most impacted countries, uh, and then a look on the right at the uh, evolution of Australia's experience in terms of how many new cases we've seen per day. So clearly mixed news in the sense that the, the global picture continues to be uh, deeply concerning and very sadly for many countries um, and indeed many advanced economies within that, they're having a lot of difficulty um, getting the virus under control. For Australia, you can see through the chart on the right that we were having difficulty um, in late March, and there was a period there um, where there was quite a high number of cases um, coming to light each day. And that was, of course, the time at which the Australian government um, initiated um, movement restrictions and the sort of shutdown that we've seen um, globally in, in, in many economies. Um, happily for Australia, um, we have seen over the past few weeks that, that that curve has tapered off. You can see there that the number of daily cases coming to light in Australia um, has been very low over the past few weeks. So that gives us confidence that we will be able to um, contain the spread of the virus. And reflecting that the number of uh, cases coming to light daily has been quite low in Australia, 
um, the table on the left shows that now yeah, we have quite a low number of, of active cases of COVID-19 um, compared to other countries. That's now dropped below um, 600. If we can move on to the next slide. Um, so while there's mixed news in the sense that the, the, the virus is, is continues to be a huge problem globally on a relative basis, at least Australia seems to be having a much more um, favourable experience in that we've managed to contain the spread, but we're not by any means immune to the economic um, fallout. And certainly we're feeling that um, in Q2 um, at the moment. I've got some forecasts here which show uh, the, the GDP forecasts for Australia uh, showing where they were uh, in February uh, before um, we saw the shutdowns and, and where they are now in May. So obviously the, the, the picture has changed substantially just as it has um, globally. Really, economists are um, yeah, facing a lot of difficulty coming up with forecasts at the moment. We've, we've really got an event that's unprecedented in its scale. It's unprecedented in the speed at which it has hit and uh, unprecedented in the level of uncertainty it's bringing. So it's very difficult to uh, accurately forecast uh, where things are likely to go because we're st even though Australia is having a, a better experience in terms of a reduced number of daily cases, we're still not quite sure um, when we'll all be able to, to get back to uh, work in a more normal way. It's likely that the, the Q1 impact in Australia won't be as great as it was in a lot of other countries because uh, it was only in late March towards the end of Q1 that we started to see um, movement restrictions brought in. Um, the impact in Q2, though, will be very much what we have seen elsewhere. And I think the experience of uh, China uh, gives us a, a clue there. And indeed, other European countries, they saw, saw very heavy GDP falls um, in Q1. And so it's likely we'll experience something similar in the second um, quarter. In the second half of the year, though, I think the fact that we've been able to contain the spread gives us um, more hope uh, that we will be able to um, gradually bring the economy um, back to life in the second half of the year, but we'll still see a significant uh, fall in GDP. Um, and it'll take some time for things to get back to normal. So people are talking about uh, different letters in terms of the shape that they expect, but I think it's reasonable to expect that we'll get a strong recovery, but I don't think we'll be able to get back um, to where we were in a great hurry. I think it'll take a while. So we'll probably have a bit of an, um, a, a, a really rapid return. Uh, obviously, some sectors, retail and hospitality, are suffering um, more so uh, than other sectors, but it will spill over to the wider uh, economy as well. We can go to the next slide. When we think about the outlook for um, the property market, uh, the outlook for employment is clearly uh, quite important within that because that's the underlying demand base for a lot of for a lot of property. We've got some forecasts here for the rate of employment growth and correspondingly the unemployment rate, and they obviously show that we, we need to expect uh, a spike in unemployment. Uh, at the moment, the labour market data in Australia are having trouble keeping up with that. The latest unemployment rate uh, moved to only 6%, but I think everyone, everyone realises that actually the underlying picture um, is worse than that. And the drop in hours worked tends to suggest that already we're sort of in the 9 to 10% range in terms of unemployment. And that's probably where we'll head over the next few months. Uh, of course, the government's put a lot of... Um, stimulus measures in place and in particular a job keeper package which is likely to um, act to you know, it's going it, it will it will cap the unemployment rate at a lower level than it otherwise uh, would uh, so we hope that we'll be able to keep that to around um, nine or ten percent um, in terms of inflation and wage growth a couple of other important economic indicators it's quite likely that they'll be a lot lower uh, so many of us will have seen some evidence of that in the, the recent um, steep decline in the oil price, uh, among other uh, other commodities, have seen uh, price declines as well, and that's an indication of the sort of deflationary pressure that we're probably going um, going to see. We're coming into a period where um, with of higher unemployment, where people's incomes are going to be challenged, and so that will lead to discounting from retailers. And so we can probably expect a couple of quarters uh, of negative inflation. These forecasts from uh, Oxford Economics don't show it going negative on an annual basis, but certainly it's expected to. Uh, dip below one. If we can go on to the next slide. Um, so obviously uh, a lot of pressures uh, on the economy and we will see 
contraction in output. I mentioned that the government has put uh, a lot of steps in place to try and contain that through the fiscal support. I think it's also important to bear in mind um, that the RBA has taken some very significant steps as well, which will provide some offset to the obvious sort of property impact that we might expect from weaker demand. Um, they've dropped the interest rate, the overnight cash rate in Australia, uh, which was about one and a half, was one and a half percent um, just over a year ago. It's now 0.25 percent, and they've, the RBA has gone further than that and they're now targeting a three-year bond yield with a view to keeping interest rates low not only in the overnight rate but also right along uh, the maturity spectrum so um, so the economy can be supported by low borrowing costs at this difficult time um, that doesn't mean that interest rates are low across the board though and so uh, we, we probably have we have seen some significant reductions in the cost of residential mortgages but in the commercial space uh, many investors are reporting a higher cost of capital at the moment because banks are wary of lending into commercial property uh, at the moment. So some variability there, even though the underlying um, pressures are, are, are over the medium term will be for lower interest rates. We can move on to the next slide, please. So just to set the scene for, for Ben and Shane here in terms of where we have been before this hit, and we've really we've been in a, in a, in a situation where we've had strong momentum uh, in both the commercial and the residential uh, markets. This is a look at annual total returns um, in commercial markets, looking at the three major sectors, office, uh, industrial and retail. And we can see that we've seen a, a sustained period of quite strong total returns, in particular for industrial and office, where we've had quite high returns over the past uh, five years. In fact, I think we've had, um, we've had five years of double digit total returns in both office uh, and industrial markets, which has reflected some quite uh, strong demand for Australian property on the investor side, but also on the occupier side, uh, those markets have benefited from a uh, strong economy and from you know, strong underlying tenant demand. Retail has been a bit different. And over the past year, we've seen, even before this began, we've seen retail being challenged uh, by the structural trend to online shopping. And that's uh, provide, provided the, a, a difficult period um, and will continue to do so, you'd have to think in this environment. Um, for, for retail and so over the past couple of years uh, even though office and industrial perform very well we started to see retail property struggle prime office yields reflecting that um, uh, are quite low so this is uh, looking at the prime office yields across the major cities and indeed one of the key reasons why we've seen that sustained run of strong returns has been um, the, the the investor uh, demand uh, driving those yields down and hence driving capital value growth in the main markets and I think that's reflected uh, a reaction um, to a weight of capital and a strong demand for Australia. Australia is very well perceived as an international investment destination, uh, but also it's been a reaction to the, the very low interest rates that we've seen for a prolonged period now. Can we move on, please, to the next slide. Um, looking at uh, what we might expect, and this is, it is quite early to assess the impact on the market, but I think, um, this slide gives a clue as to what we might expect in terms of the sector uh, impact uh, of COVID-19 and how that might play out. What I have here is a chart looking at the uh, year-to-date performance of the listed sector in Australia. And what that shows is that the share prices of um, our major REITs uh, have been downgraded. It's interesting to note um, that the, the downgrades have been more significant, uh, and I think unsurprisingly for uh, for on, on the retail side, uh, given the pressure that that sector was already under and, and the issues that this is going to cause uh, for underlying demand in that sector. At the other end of the spectrum, we would tend to expect the industrial market to hold up a bit better, um, given that it, it, its underlying demand is less related to and uh, more related to the underlying structural changes, I think, going on in retail, which give it, give it a cushion relative to the other sectors. We feel the office sector is somewhere in the middle where at the, at the, there'll be uh, a nuance and difference as to how this, how, how I really think that better property um, will hold up well, but um, in, in less well regarded property and less well regarded lower quality uh, stock will find it more difficult in the current environment. If we move on to the last slide, please, for me. Um, on the residential front, well, just as um, we had strong market momentum coming into this um, on the commercial uh, front, we did in the second half of the year see 
quite strong momentum in the residential market. The context is different though in that, that, that before that, and so really from, um, the, 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 from late 2017 uh, up until the middle of last year, we'd seen a downturn in residential markets uh, in, in the mainstream markets, particularly in Sydney and Melbourne, where, where previously we'd seen a really strong run of price growth up until the end of, of 2017. We saw a correction in those markets. Uh, that correction ended in the middle of last year, and we saw quite a lot of growth returning uh, to those markets in the second half of last year. And you can see that reflected here in this look at price growth in the apartment uh, segment. A split across major cities in this uh, of 2019. So the markets were in recovery phase, uh, having seen uh, that downturn up until uh, mid 2019. Now, obviously, this has interrupted that, and we would expect the market to um, to, to, to feel the impact of uh, of a weaker outlook for employment and weaker um, consumer sentiment, of course. But as I mentioned, um, an offsetting factor to that is the very low interest rate rates that we see in the residential market uh, does tend to be quite responsive to that. So there's opposing forces going on uh, there in the residential market, and I'll show and I'll cover um, that and how that's playing out in a bit more uh, detail in a moment. I'll leave it there and hand on to Ben and Shane. But very happy to um, take some of your questions in the panel session later. Thanks, Ben. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ben Schubert. I'm the National Head of Agency for Knight Frank Australia. Uh, if we just click onto the first slide. Um, so I'll be talking through the investor and occupier markets um, for Australia uh, with you today. Um, as you can see, the graph on your left-hand side compares transaction volumes for quarter one through the last five years, um, you'll see that there's a 50% uh, drop <clears throat> from um, the uh, from previous years through to 2020. Um, that is partially uh, accountable for COVID-19. However, the, <clears throat> the um, request for proposals and assets um, that were being taken to market in, in the first quarter uh, were fairly light on um, to start with regardless. Um, so I guess COVID-19 kicking in in late February, March, um, really emphasised that below grade um, trend. If you look across the, um, the asset classes being office, industrial, retail and hotels, office um, occupation is uh, the, the uh, aspect that many investors are grappling with at the moment in terms of uh, potential acquisitions as to how to underwrite um, the occupier market, um, both in terms of those tenants seeking rent relief um, and also those that are physically unable to be in occupation um, at the moment. It's fair to say rental growth expectations have been trimmed for the next two years with um, each valuation house in, in Sydney certainly expecting zero to one percent growth in, uh, in base rents. Anecdotally, uh, we're seeing incentives uh, move out in the order of 7 or 8% um, for Sydney CBD prime office assets. Um, we would expect that to, to maintain over the next few months. However, we don't, we don't expect um, to see a huge amount of movement um, in the face rental achieves. There is, there is still a significant weight of capital um, both domestically and off offshore looking to Australia and particularly the major capital cities of Sydney and Melbourne. Uh, we are challenged through physical constraints, both uh, with investors traveling into our country and, um, the ability, and also the ability to inspect assets. We um, expect that to continue for the short medium term. Uh, however, there's uh, a number of different technological advancements that are being used to facilitate virtual inspections. Um, and we're, we're really getting into that over the next couple of weeks as we bring assets to market <clears throat> and really just testing how um, how that works in the new environment that we're in. I would expect certain transactions to be subject to inspections and also a greater reliance on local uh, Australian managers helping um, offshore capital purchase in Australia. If we just click over to the next slide. <clears throat> 
Moving on to the occupier mark, market, the graph on the left hand side um, outlines deal progression since March 2020. Um, as you can see, the, the vast majority of transactions are now on hold. Um, we are expecting this trend to continue at least for the next month or two, where um, requirements are either put on hold or um, the stay put option is, is taken up. Um, I guess when we're in an environment that is very uncertain, the, um, the, the obvious choice is to, to stay put on a short term um, occupation for your office requirement. Um, there's very much been a slowdown in activity, although over the last couple of weeks, we're starting to see a number of briefs hit the market for new movement, particularly in that 1,000 to 2,000 square metre uh, range of tenancy sizes. Uh, businesses are definitely focusing on their op operational issues um, and, and keeping them, in some instances, keeping the businesses running. Um, there's obviously uh, plenty of government stimulus has been uh, outlined earlier that that is um, helping groups um, through this period and that will continue through till at least the 30th of September um, this year. There are a number of tenants um, in the office sector, SMEs who have asked for rent relief. That is um, not the majority, I would say, in the office market. However, in the retail market, there is, there is quite a few across our major institutional clients um, who have asked for rent relief. Um, many of those who are unable to be physically in occupation uh, for the past uh, two or so months. We expect uh, deal volume um, to be patchy, but to um, start to tick up um, as we return back to the office. There are a number, a number of um, organisations are slowly moving their workforces back into the office, um, but there's obviously a, a review under, underway in light of COVID-19 of which roles could be um, undertaken from a working from home capacity or certain organisations undertaking decentralisation strategies so that um, they could have a smaller headquarters within a Sydney CBD or a main CBD of, the, of Australia uh, and have a bigger presence in a, in a secondary location um, such as Parramatta or North Sydney. <clears throat> we expect uh, incentives to remain high for a period of time. Um, as I said to you earlier, the, the average increase on deals that we're seeing go out the door is in the order of 7 to 8 percent, which obviously has an effect on the, um, the achieved effective rental, group, rental uh, for particular space. We move on to the next slide. Um, so in order to, I guess, sum things up, <clears throat> um, key messages. Um, we, we did have strong momentum um, heading into COVID-19, although I would say that particularly in the office market, um, there was not a, a lot of availability of stock. Uh, our retail market, um, I should have touched on earlier, is, is, is very much challenged as a number of markets, uh, sorry, as is for many cities around the globe. Um, I expect that sector to see the, um, the strongest um, push-out yields. Uh, through the COVID-19 period. Our major Australian institutions will be reporting on their valuations uh, around the 30th of June, uh, and I would expect to see significant increases in their core capitalisation rates and, and effective decreases in the, the book values of those assets. The logistics market um, will probably be the market that will hold up the best, um, and certainly um, some landlords did very well out of the COVID-19 uh, period where they had vacancy um, and tenants needed to fill uh, the <clears throat> fill that va vacancy quickly um, to take advantage of uh, logistics movements over the COVID-19 period. We do expect discounted pricing to emerge in the next couple of months. Um, <clears throat> that will be very much weighted towards quality. Um, as you can see, the, the fourth point, the flight to quality Excuse me one second. <coughs> the flight to quality um, aspect will, will remain where we will see um, prime long leased assets, particularly those that are leased to federal or state governments, remain the favour of investors over the next six to 12 months as they seek a safe haven for their capital. Where you have risk, where, whether it be um, through exposure to a certain sector, tenant, grade or location, those assets will be priced appropriately 
and that will um, that will no doubt involve some decompression in yields as um, over the last two years we began to see core plus assets trade at the same cap rates as core assets we feel that the core plus will be priced uh, much more appropriately over the coming 12 to 24 months we continue to see a focus we will continue to see a focus on sydney and melbourne as the um the places to go for um, offshore capital into australia albeit we do see a lot of demand for brisbane uh, and to a lesser extent perth canberra is uh, one of the the major cbd that is um, on everyone's lips at the moment in that um, canberra has a large exposure to the federal government um, being out uh, you know where the parliament is located the national parliament is located and for that reason we'll we will continue to see assets uh, desirable particularly from offshore capital uh, and we don't expect to see a large decompression in yields or drop in value on those particular assets thank you very much Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks, Ben. Uh, thanks for tuning in to our webinar this afternoon. As um, as Alex said earlier, I'm Shane Harris, National Head of Residential for Knight Frank Australia. Um, if we go to the next slide, please. Before we get to th where things are at in Australia in the residential market today, I thought it would be helpful just to run through where things were prior to coronavirus hitting our shores in in late February, and just going back to mid 2019, um, APRA ease its guidance on serviceability assessments for residential mortgages. Now, what this did was enabled people to immediately borrow generally between 20 and 30% more money than they had been able to previously. And this, this cash or these borrowings flowed into the market at a really rapid rate at the back end of 2019 and early 2020. At that stage, most of the markets across Australia were in pretty good shape. Perth was probably still struggling off the back of the resource boom from 10 or 12 years ago. But everywhere else was going great. Even Tasmania was in you know, a really good space as well. There was also a shortage of housing stock, which was further exacerbating the price increases. And to be frank, there was a real sense of FOMO in the market, a fear of missing out, which we hadn't seen since probably 2013. I also call auctions as, as part of my job. And I was going out to auctions late last year, early this year, where people were quoting, or the agents rather were quoting, a million or $1.1 million. And these things were selling for one, three, one, four, even $1.5 million in some cases. So that in turn drove increased um, demand and price increases, which were just so dramatic that, as I said before, no one could actually keep up with what was happening. So before coronavirus hit us here, um, things were in pretty fantastic shape, to be frank. Um, next slide, please. Uh, now, once, so in, as Ben said earlier, coronavirus, our first case here was on about the 28th of February this year. Um, we had a massive auction weekend planned the week before Easter, um, and this caused an immediate withdrawal of stock. The government lockdown came into play. On that Saturday before Easter, there were slated to be about 1,500 residential auctions in Sydney. Now, a really good day in Sydney for auction numbers is between 900 and 1,000, so this was a massive day. And the lockdowns came the week before that. So immediately about 50% of those offerings were withdrawn from the market. Those that remained either went through an online auction process or they went to private treaty. So they were offered for sale with an asking price. Now, surprisingly, given everything that was happening, still over 50% of those assets traded on that day. Um, where we sit today, um, and it's been fairly consistent for about four weeks now, the, the current stock levels are down about 35% nationally year on year. Uh, and side by side with that, the number of properties for rent has gone up by 35% year on year. This is, of course, the result of people losing their jobs and having to amalgamate households, even you know, young couples moving back home or moving in with friends and family to just get through this time. Listening to some webinars from the four major banks in the last couple of weeks, the mortgage ac uh, applicant numbers remain particularly strong and particularly in the first home buyer space. Now that surprised the major banks. They've been expecting that number to drop off for about four weeks now. It just hasn't happened yet, but that's not to say it won't. Our price declines outside of the oversupplied apartment markets. Now, these markets were really struggling even before coronavirus. There was, there was lots of property for sale. There were lots of completions happening. There was you know, high rental vacancy rates. So those markets were out on their feet anyway. 
So, but outside of those, the mid market and the prime and subprime markets have continued to perform particularly well. We've transacted deals at you know minor reductions from asking price. We've done three in the last two weeks: one at four nine fifty asking five, one at five million fifty asking five point one, and we're hopefully going to transact something circa nine million at about a fifty thousand dollar reduction from asking price. So, you know, touch wood, you know, things continue to tick along quite nicely here for the time being. Next slide, please. As Ben said, the government support mechanisms remain in force until late September this year. Now, side by side with the um, monetary support, there's also been a couple of initiatives in place that allows mortgage holders to not pay their mortgage for six months and then to repay the accrued interest over the life of the, uh, the loan. And also for landlords and tenants to work out a reduced amount of rental income, of course, they pay that back over the balance of their, their term of their lease as well. Couple of big numbers though, households suffering mortgage distress increased pre-COVID-19 from about 100,000 to well over 1.4 million today. So that's well over 10% of the households in Australia that are suffering mortgage distress. As Ben said, un unemployment rate tipped to remain above 7% until early 2022 at least. So of course the recovery of the jobs market is key to housing market stability to that end. Government aims for the majority of business to be open by July 2020. This number is a little bit out of date now, but I think the important point is that the government is aiming to restore about 85% of the jobs prior to the removal of those support mechanisms. Now, if they can manage to do that, as I said before, I think the middle part of the market and the upper end of the market should survive fairly well. Unfortunately, one of the effects that we're seeing of coronavirus globally is it's impacting lower income households more so than it's impacting middle and upper end households. Putting all of this together, we would suggest that you should be extremely cautious around the acquisition of high rise off the plan developments in B grade locations. We expect to be that there's probably going to be more significant price drops, obviously high rental vacancies, um, temporary citizens, a lot of those are probably going to have to move home because those support mechanisms don't actually apply to them. So if they can't get a job, then obviously it's really hard to live in Sydney and Melbourne particularly because it's expensive. Um, and in turn, we think there'll be settlement difficulties because the valuation discrepancies, high valuation, sorry, high vacancy rates, reduced um, rental income, of course, is going to result in price reduction. Uh, having said that, we think the general housing market, the mid market should be okay. Um, suggestions of between five and 10% have been typically suggested by the major banks. Um, some outlying banks have suggested much greater numbers, but we think if all of these things come together, for the balance of 2020 and early 21, certainly we, we we're hoping that things should continue to be fairly stable, all of that put together. So that's it from me. Look, thanks again for joining. I'll hand you over now to Steve Douglas from SMATS. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks, Sharon. You know, the guys, you know, it, um, all very interesting. I, I get the, the nice uh, the nice part where I don't have to worry about statistics and numbers. I can just get into a, a little bit of, of obiter on, on how you can protect yourself. So. We'll get straight into my slides there if you can. As always, I have to start with a quick disclaimer. It just says, just bear in mind that the, this is general advice. Please you know, look at your own personal circumstance before taking any of these things into account. Let's get straight into it. Well, we'll have a look at what, from a landlord perspective, and landlords are obviously the ones that are in the market, um, you know, got taken by surprise when COVID came with everybody else, and, uh, you know, a little bit of meat in the sandwich. Um, you know, the important thing is if you are a landlord, and thankfully we can say a lot of this is now in the review mirror, or hopefully staying in the review mirror at least. And the most important thing is to work with facts. We, you know, we saw lots of rumours, lots of inactivity, um, inaction, false statements, etc. And even with regards to your tenants, you know, literally as soon as COVID started beginning a bit of publicity early on in the piece, and they were talking about um, not having to pay rents, everyone and their dog rang up looking for rent reductions or rent free periods. But it was simply a case that they, people had to prove that they actually were impacted by COVID. And until we started demanding facts, and we were pretty quick on, on the draw with that, then you know, it quickly dissipated and we started dealing with the real cases. Um, make sure that you, know, you are getting the facts from your tenants, your, your property agents in regards to what you can and can't do. It's critical to do that. Uh, there are government incentives. They're not significant, but they are there in play. And we'll talk about them on the next slide. But you know, get familiar with what may be available both to yourself and also to your tenant. And make sure you've got good support. 
Um, in times like this, it's critical that you're getting good advice from your property manager, from your accounting, from your legal, wherever it is you're seeking and make sure they've got a good handle on what's going on. Um, we can't um, emphasize the importance of a sensible tenant. And, and to be truthful, not just in a COVID environment, it's something that you know, we've been doing this now for over 25 years. We've always you know, encouraged our landlords to look after their tenant because they're looking after your asset. At a time like now, that's ever more um, important. Um, do what you can to help them. You know, um, you know, bear in mind that even if you do lose the tenant because they've lost their job and they can't pay, you've still got to find a replacement and they may not be as good. They may be in just as a dire predicament, et cetera. So you don't want to be competing with those other 35% of vacancies that was mentioned earlier. And of course, you know, if you are having cash flow difficulty through loss of rents, through issues, you've got the ability to defer your payments. Okay, it's a deferral rather than a wipe off. So it's still going to be hanging around you, but at least it's going to give you a breathing space while things recover. Um, quickly having a look on the next slide at the uh, you know, incentives available. They're across the board and there's some of them that are federal. And of course, what the government was very quick to do was to ensure that no one could be evicted. They also made sure that the message was very clear that you know, uh, tenants could not avoid paying their rent, but they could go into negotiation to defer and at the behest of their landlord, only then you know, get a, a um, waiver. Um, but some governments around the, the country were suggesting that there should be an equal emphasis on waiver and deferral. Some were saying it's up to the, the parties to negotiate. But they were trying to suggest be fair, be reasonable to each other. We saw a few tribunals pop up um, around the place to ensure that if there wasn't fairness able to be reached, that it could be arbitrated in, in a sensible way. Um, but uh, very important, it was was um, emphasised across the country that you know you could not terminate a tenant if their their circumstances was you know affected because of COVID issues. But you did retain the right that if it was just a bad tenant and it was not you know COVID related, i.e., he just thought oh, I've still got my job, but I don't want to pay rent because no one else is, then that tenant could still be evicted for lack of payment. It had to be COVID impacted for them to get the protections. The banks have been um, given, as you saw earlier, $90 billion to help with these deferred lending you know, packages for both landlords and small businesses. So if you were having that cash flow struggle, a six month deferral accumulated onto your interest rate paid off later is a help. But probably the biggest thing that came in was those interest rate cuts. And they've certainly meant that the cash cost of owning the property you know, is certainly a lot less than it was for a while there. Um, the states have also brought in um, a token but welcome gesture with land tax, which has been creeping up. And again, if your property has COVID effect issues on your tenant, you can ask for a 25% discount on your, your land tax, you know, um, some as, as waivers as well. Um, but there is a, a um, requirement that this is passed on to the tenant. You can't keep it as a landlord as your back pocket saving. It must be passed on because you've been affected by lack of rent collection. And the, the state governments at various you know, states have, have brought out some rent subsidy support. Um, you can see the 2000 figure seems to be consistent across the, the country. And once more, when the tenant receives the subsidy, there is a requirement that they must pass this on to the landlord. They can't just keep it you know, for their own benefit. Um, again, just finishing off down the bottom, you can see that, you know, there is a, a very clear, defined message that there is no support, there is no subsidy, there is no benefits, unless you are genuinely impacted by COVID. So you have to prove loss of job, you know, um, being you know, uh, contaminated or, you know, extreme financial hardship as a result of COVID. Next slide. For, for those people that own a property or are considering entering the market to acquire their first or, or next property, now here are a few things to consider as an owner or a buyer. And the first one I suppose is, is definitely don't worry about short-term instability. It would be a miracle if there wasn't instability. You can't have a global shutdown, you know, something that is on, on a, a massive you know, nature, loss, loss of employment, et cetera, without some level of fear and instability. That, that is just you know, par for the course in this situation. So don't be surprised that that's there. It would not be logical if it wasn't. Now, we're obviously seeing a lot of doomsday predictions. I've seen you know, predictions of up to 30% fall in, inter, in um, property market prices. I don't believe them to be the case. And one of the key reasons I believe that is the fact that you know, the interest rates have you know, been cut so much. 
know, when you start hearing about discounts of say 30% as an example, you have to bear in the mind that the interest rate that that owner is currently experiencing is now dropped down to somewhere around the three to 4% rate. So what it means is he might as well, even if the property was vacant, cop a 12 month cost of three or 4% holding on interest rather than give an instant 30% deduction in price to get rid of the property. Now, this would not be the same scenario if interest rates were significantly higher, you know, even six, seven, eights, nines percent of the old days. So don't be surprised if you just see paralysis from the sellers that will not enter into agreements to sell at these massive discounts. It will not stop people offering these discounts. I'm sure there's going to be loads of people walking around saying, I'll buy your property, I want 10, 20, 30 percent off but I don't think that you're gonna see you know, people selling their property at those rates. And certainly if you are an owner, I would recommend you do not accept a instant discount. The key to getting things back to normal has always been and will be through this population growth. And this is gonna be another little anomaly because we're seeing the borders closed in Australia for the first time, and hence the normal migration patterns are not going to be there over the next three to six months until the borders start opening up and the government works out what's going on. But I'm predicting very strongly that not only will we see the people that were going to come, but we'll see the people that are coming and we're gonna see a whole lot more people that want to come. So you're gonna have, I think, a surge in Australia. And one of the reasons was you saw in the earlier presentation, we're up at number 83 on the charts with you know, 7,000 odd you know, cases and just past 100 deaths. Now that's massive advertising on a global scale. And I was quite surprised even having a chat with some friends in the US, that's not even being promoted in Australia, in, in the US at the moment, because they don't want that on the news because it would stand too much to, to the side of what their outcomes have been and show how well we're doing and then say, hey, how come they're not doing that well? But expect it to be very, very relevant you know, um, advertising towards the end of this COVID crisis that will see a lot of people choose Australia as their preferred destination and access. In, the, in regards to that, you know, when we do have high population growth through migration in particular, it emphasises the importance of livability in your property. You know, we talked earlier on, um, about the, the uh, you know, apartment market, particularly in the B-grade property. They're always going to struggle because they're usually just not livable. And we've uh, coined the phrase stops, you know, small, tall and overpriced for a lot of the inner city properties, particularly in Melbourne to a lesser extent in Sydney. You know, you can't expect someone to pay top, top dollar for inferior product. And livability is literally what it's all about. People have a lot of choice this, these days and they want the best livable standard for their money, especially if they're writing out big checks. So whatever you do, you need to assess whatever you're buying and whatever you indeed already own for its livability. If it's not highly livable, it's probably not highly desirable and therefore its capacity to to command a better price is going to diminish. So you want to consider also maybe reshuffling your portfolio. Now in the good old days of five, 10 years ago when finance was readily available, et cetera, everyone could just keep acquiring more and more property as long as they had a little bit of equity. But now it's a lot harder to get finance. So you tend to find once you hit two, three, four properties, the banks are refusing to lend to you because their servicing tests are now far more aggressive on income capacity. As a result, if you want to keep buying property, you might have to get rid of one to buy another one. So what you want to be looking at is overall in your portfolio, are all the properties worth keeping? Do they all have that livability attraction? And if they don't, maybe shuffle one out the door and replace it with something that's better. One of the things we always, um, particularly for expatriates, remind you the importance of is have you got your future home? You know, at any time, a good property is worth buying. Um, and if you don't know where you're going to live on return, then certainly putting that on the table early as discussion and perhaps acquisition is, is great. Rent it out until you do return. But at, of course, at a time like now, most people t tend to take a very quick view of what their future is and how long they'll be overseas. And hence, we see a lot of increase in activity at the moment, in expatriate acquisition. Now, this is exactly what happened during SARS. It's exactly what happened during the global financial crisis, the Asian crisis. So obviously when you're dealing with unforeseen issues, it certainly gets your focus about how important work is versus life balance. And if you haven't got your home, you, start, you should start thinking about that.
you know, don't be too disappointed if you go hunting for a property to not get those massive discounts. As I say, I don't think sellers are going to be willing to give them to you. So you need to be realistic in what you're able to achieve price point wise. There is going to be demand. There's always vultures circusing every ca uh, ca uh, carcass. Don't be the one that misses out. You know, there is usually only one or two good properties for sale. Once someone's bought it, it's going to, you have to start your search all over again. So be sensible in your price points, but make sure it's quality driven. And finishing off their fortune follows the brave, not the foolish. You know, it's smart to be brave on quality assets, livable assets, value assets. It's foolish to just pick up bargains that are somebody else's problem. So although you want to be brave, you want to be sensible. You want to have great confidence in whatever you acquire or do own and then see how you go. I'm pretty sure you'll find there'll be a quick turnaround because Australia has now proven its way through this. And as long as we don't go into a major relapse, which is largely gonna happen only if there's a, a massive relaxation on the borders, which seems unlikely, I think we'll be out of this on the right side very, very quickly. Um, it's gonna be an interesting time, but you're just gonna to have to ride it through. You know, and that's the most important thing. Hopefully that gives you a little bit of uh, a foresight into what to do and a few tips to, to survive this. And thanks very much for your attention. Thanks, Steve. Uh, so we've moved into the Q&A session um, for today's presentation. So I'll just go straight into it. So what I'll do is uh, I'll go down the list and I'll ask a question. Um, and let any of our panelists jump in and answer it if they've got something to say. Um, so the first question is, what is the outlook for property prices in Melbourne, Brisbane and Hobart in 2020, 2021? So this is, this is already a big one. Would anyone like to take it? Yeah, I'll go. Sure. Okay, go. Okay, sure. <laughs> oh, you go, Ben, go. Well, I'll start, you can uh, finish. I mean, uh, you, you had on your slide there that, uh, you know, generally we could expect on average uh, and, and we don't have a city, well, I'll start, we don't have a city specific uh, forecast, but I, I would agree with Shane's slide. I think generally uh, we would expect some price declines on average, but our view would be more that for the mainstream market, that'll be in the five to 10% range. And I think we say that because even though there is um, yeah, a, a weak economy at the moment and higher unemployment, which you would always associate with um, negative sentiment and weaker prices. I think the nature of this event means that while the, the drop in activity is really significant, I think if we can get back to growth in the second half of the year, then a lot of people can look through it to some degree. And so you wouldn't expect the drop to be as significant as perhaps in past um, episodes of recession, even though the actual economic numbers will be um, very bad. You know, I say that we, obviously that there is a lot of uncertainty at the moment. We don't quite know um, how we will go in terms of the lifting of restrictions and how much activity we'll be able to bring back. The other thing I'd say is that um, a lot of the unemployment is oh, yeah, obviously it's sad whenever we see higher unemployment, but a lot of the people that have probably been made unemployed were not natural buyers in a sense that, that the first wave has hit retail and hospitality workers who are generally a bit younger. And as you mentioned, they unfortunately shine the, the sad fact is that it has hit lower income um, demographics a bit harder. Uh, and then, you know, the other offsetting factor, of course, is the, is the interest rate. So, yes, we've been hit with this overwhelming negative shock. Uh, but I, th I think the fact that the buyer base um, hasn't been sort of perhaps hit as badly as the unemployment figures might suggest, and we've got that offset of, of, uh, of very low interest rates, um, you know, that they do act as meaningful offsets. And just in relation to those three locations, I, I think Hobart is probably flat out in relation to affordability now. Hobart's had a great run for the last two years, but on an affordability scale now, I, I don't think there's much space in there for growth. Um, although I would also suggest that there'll be a drive to those locations like Tasmania, whereby you know it's an island, they can shut things down very quickly in case something like that happens. Again, hopefully not. Um, Melbourne, I think the forecast, as I said earlier, should be fairly stable, um, depending on um, job growth again. 
I read a report on Brisbane actually just before we got on this afternoon, coincidentally. Um, I, I think there's probably uh, a feeling that there might be a slight drop across particularly the Brisbane CBD, but the general Bris Brisbane housing market should perform fairly well. And uh, just flowing from that one, we have another one. Um, what do you see the apartment market looking like in H3 and H4 in 2020? I'll have a crack at that one. Um, like I said, we've been monitoring this for a while. I think, you know, um, it's really going to come down to what it is. Obviously, anything that, that is small, and if you imagine, in particularly in places like Melbourne, um, the market's been, you know, artificially held up by student population and also by Airbnb and short-term accommodation. Those two things are going to be drastically impacted as a result of COVID because both students coming back in and also, you know, tourism numbers are massively down. So you're going to see, you know, uh, an unusual scenario here where, you know, where probably there was a weakness that was covered up is going to be unearthed even, even more ugly than ever before. So that's going to be very interesting because a lot of those apartments aren't generally highly livable for the long term anyways. I think if you've got um, anything in the inner city, it's going to be tarred with the same brush, you know, because there's a lot of new supply in the inner cities, particularly on the East Coast. But I think, you know, if you've got something that is genuinely livable, particularly if it's city fringe, I think you're still seeing a, a large downsizer trend in Australia. So if that, if that apartment, you know, does offer all the features of livability to a potential downsizer, there's a lot of underlying strength in that zone. But if you are in a, a small apartment with low ceilings and, you know, just a massive glass tower over 30 storeys, then good luck. Good luck with that with or without COVID, I should say. Um, so here's a, here's a good one. So after surpassing the crisis, what are the, the, the best ways to easily get back into the Australian market? Or, and do you have any tips to do that? Yeah, I'll, I'll tackle that one too. I suppose the, the first thing, and, and it sort of flows on from where we were at the back end of last year before COVID, Finance is still the most difficult issue facing anyone wanting to, to invest in Australian property. You know, both foreigners, expatriates especially, um, it's a lot harder to get loans than before. It really is the most important thing if you want, number one tip, get your finance approved before you go looking. Um, you know, particularly if you had been looking a few years ago, money was readily available. If you think that's still available, you might be in for a nasty shock. So start with your finance, get pre-approved, assess your budget and then start looking around as to what what opportunity you've got on that budget without that finance you could be bitterly disappointed where you find the property of your dreams and you just are told that it's not really available to you because the money's not on the table so start with your finance and then go hunting from there so we've talked quickly briefly about melbourne brisbane and hobart and someone's asking us Will the price of Sydney property go down after COVID nineteen? Um, does anyone want to take that one? About Sydney. Well, I think I probably covered that off fairly closely um, in my earlier discussion. But yeah, I mean, the oversupplied markets were struggling before COVID nineteen. That the housing market in general should hold up fairly well. Yeah, again, it's supply and demand. I mean, the the pressure was on there because of the migration. You're going to have a temporary reduction in that, and then you're going to have a surge. So I, I don't, you know, for all those that are hopeful that Sydney prices will crash and they'll get some bargains, um, sorry, that ain't going to happen long term. You know, you'll have a pocket of opportunity maybe, but again, you're not necessarily going to get good quality property come on the market at a discount. So be ready to jump if it's there, because there'll be a queue. But um, you know, just be, you know, understanding that there's, there's other forces at play, which is just natural supply and demand. Not the answer I wanted to hear. <laughs> um, got another one here. So what is the percentage of mainland buyers in the residential markets now? Anyone? Well, I, I've got all the stats on that one. So yeah, go, Steve. Go. So I suppose, you know, what, what a lot of people don't realise, and just some quick numbers off the top, is there's 10.4 10 million properties in Australia, and uh, China's only really become a, a buyer in the last 10 years of, of significant note. In the residential market, you know, they, they bought about 100,000 properties over the last 10 years. So, you know, you're, you're looking at officially only about 1% of the, the property market is owned by mainland Chinese. Um, obviously, there's, there's a few more that have migrated that don't show 
go in those FIOB numbers. But you know, in terms of tr pure foreign investor, it's about you know one percent of the market. You know, even at its peak, and the peak was in 2016, 30,000 Chinese bought properties. You know, bear in mind there's around about 150 to 200,000 new properties a year in Australia, residential properties. So in its peak, it was about 20% of the new property acquisition. That's now dropped down to about 7,000. So we're back down to less than 5% of new purchase acquisitions uh, by Chinese. So it's not a really big number. Everyone was blaming the Chinese for pushing prices up. They actually were just supporting the market by bringing new stock into it. But um, you know, they're, they're not as big as people realize. And even our entire foreign investor ownership is still around about 3% in Australia, which surprises most people because they perceive it to be significantly more. But uh, it's still only less than 3% foreign investor. China's only about 1%. I just also comment, I, I think it was ex exacerbated once again because there was a wave, as Steve said, in sort of 13 through 16, probably a bit earlier than that as well, actually, whereby a number of um, mainland Chinese bought really high end, you know, Point Piper, Rose Bay assets. Um, but a couple of them got burnt as well. So they're buying them through, you know, funny company structures. And once they're investigated, they actually were forced to unsell the properties. So side by side with, with that, I think the Chinese government clamped down on, you know, cash flow coming out of, of China as well. So really the numbers on the ground day to day are very, very low. So we mentioned that there were some changes to the APRA uh, in the past, but someone's asking, do you anticipate any future amend amendments um, by the APRA following COVID-19? No, no, we don't. So previously they'd apply a cap of between, so that if you were borrowing money, they would apply an interest rate of between seven and 7.5%. What they did was reduce that to 2.5% above the cap rate. So it essentially because previously, obviously mortgage rates and the um, RBA rate was much higher. Um, so that was the cause for that. But, but I think they're fairly comfortable now with the 2.5% buffer. Yeah, and just to add to that, I mean, a lot of people forget that those APRA guidelines have, have kept the Australian banking industry as the safest in the world. So you don't want them to relax them too much, you know, but, uh, you know, we've always had sensible policy, just most people didn't realise things like that servicing rate was, was so high, but that's a protective measure because we have, a, you know, rules in Australia that if the bank lends you money that you couldn't afford, they, they don't get the money back. You get a free, free house without a loan. So that's why the banks are always so protective. They don't want to be giving you free free money to buy your house. I wouldn't complain if they did. <laughs> no. um, so maybe the last question. Uh, what are the expectations for construction costs? I don't know if anyone can provide some insights into this one. Well, I'll, I'll start on that. I, I, look, I think, uh, as I mentioned, I think we'll be, for at least the next six months or so, we'll be in a deflationary environment. We, we've seen mo that most dramatically through um, oil prices, some other commodities, not all of them. Um, and, you know, more generally, we'll, we, we were already, we'll continue to be in an environment of low wage inflation. And uh, now due to COVID-19, we'll be seeing higher unemployment. So off the back of that, you'd have to think that there's going to be, if not downward pressure, then certainly no upward pressure on um, construction costs in the near term. I mean, there, there may be isolated pockets where there's skill shortages in particular skills due to competing with government infrastructure which will go ahead but more, more generally we would expect downward pressure on construction costs. I think the reason um, that doesn't necessarily mean to say that you know, off the back of low construction costs that will mean all the developers are going to turn the tap on. I, mean, I think there's other reasons that the guys have already alluded to oversupply in some parts of the apartment market already and difficulty getting finance which will restrain the level of development coming forward even though even though there are low construction costs. Yeah, and you, you're also going to be seeing um, developer procrastination, you know, if they can't get their pre-sales, if they're worried about what price points they're going to get because of rumour or speculation. So you're going to find that a lot of projects will go on hold as well. And then that's going to force, you know, put the construction industry under pressure to discount. And uh, we're already seeing that come into play. But there's a balancing factor. It's, 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 a, it's a fine line we walk. You know, it's a fine line we walk. So I think we're about uh, out of time for today. Uh, but before we go, I'd like to thank again ben, ben Burston, Ben Schubert, and Shane Harris from Knight Frank Australia, and Steve Douglas from Smats Group for taking their time out today to share your knowledge and expertise with us all today. Um, I'll just remind everyone again that if you want to access more information about 
uh, Reaper Night Prank, Night Prank Australia, or SMAT, um, and their services, you can find it on their website. Alternatively, feel free to reach out to us at Anscham Taipei, or of course your local chamber, and we're more than happy to uh, connect you to them. Um, so once again, just thank you again to our speakers. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Alex.